welcome to the I Lit Wit podcast, episode number two. Uh, it is actually now August the 4th, but we, re- we uh, put this together on the 1st, and uh, I'm Dr. James Kundart. I'm Dr. Len Hua. And we want to make the disclaimer that this should not be used as medical advice. Please see your eye doctor. Yes, a medical doctor, if you have another problem. So uh, here we are as your hosts. I think we have our picture up here on the next screen. We'll see if we can get it to advance. Um, the... Uh, the I Live With podcast is to talk about the intersection of technology and ocular disease, and it seems like is where we're going with this. At the moment, but then the scope may broaden. So the idea is just to, to uh, share with you some of the uh, things that we learned from the literature that's relevant to eye care and share with you some of the wit that we got from those, those uh, understanding uh, literature. Feel free to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and we'll also be on iTunes University. So our topics today... What Two topics, like? yeah. One is a uh, smartphone bad for your eyes, and and in in this case, James has, has actually firsthand experience. You have smartphone, and you're actually doing some research on smartphones, so you will be uh, very suitable in terms of answering this question. And we'll talk also about what we uh, see in the literature concerning vitamin C and cataract prevention. Maybe not reversal, but cataract prevention. Yeah, prevention. So. <laughs> yes. All right. I don't know how many of our audience have a, a Amazon Kindle or a Barnes and Noble Nook. Uh, they are slightly different devices. Uh, the, the the Kindle is not a backlit display, but the uh, the Nook and, and like your smartphone is an LCD display that you can read in the dark. And uh, there was uh, in the recent issue of the Academy Journal, uh, which I have here in my hand, from uh, Optometry and Vision Science from July of, of this year, just last month, talks about the uh, the effect of smartphone on viewing distance uh, compared to a, a Kindle, and um, a particular smartphone in 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 particular. This is a Rosenfeld and others wrote about this. I know I've been away from SUNY for a while because I don't recognize all the authors anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> um, for uh, the concern is, is uh, you, you know, with new technology that they will eventually harm our health because the technology is changing much faster than the human organism can uh, sure. adapt to it. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, many of us are, are uh, like we see here on our, our commuter trains, we see people reading smartphones or sometimes uh, e-book readers mm-hmm. for, for uh, the whole commute, uh, maybe an hour at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they seem comfortable, but, but are they? They're lighter to carry around for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, what SUNY found in their Academy Journal publication that's, that's already gone through peer review is that they found that, that the uh, working distance for smartphones is considerably closer than it is for hard copy. And while they couldn't prove any particular discomfort or effect on the visual system, um, when, when viewing these devices, they did find that, that people, when we're doing text messaging and, and such, they were holding it much closer. And, you know, part of that is, I think, is the, is the having the type effect. You know, when mm-hmm. you're looking at hard copy, you, you know, unless you're following along with your finger or highlighting, you don't have to use your hands other than to hold it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you're using a, a screen or even a stylus on a, you know, you have, to, uh, you have to hold it close enough to make that comfortable. And it does increase the accommodative demand. But... We, we studied this in Portland. I, you weren't there in Atlanta, I don't think, right? No, you know, no, the, no. You know the yet. clinic assignment in our downtown clinic this summer. No. But, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I, I'll have to show you sometime. But we, uh, we got out our bar readers and we uh, put them in front of our Amazon Kindle uh, and put them in front of uh, iPhone 4. And we, on the same story, the same font size and everything, mm-hmm. we, we wanted to see if, uh, and comparing to hard copy, see if our, if our research subjects held things at different distances. And of course they did, um, usually closer with the smaller screen. So we were closer with iPhone. Because, we did, okay. but, but we were mostly concerned about people adaptations people would do to make that more comfortable. And uh, what we did with the bar readers found out if people were suppressing. And to our great surprise, all, all these asymptomatic subjects were suppressing, at least intermittently, and sometimes alternating which eye they were suppressing. And I, as I've said to you before, this led me to believe that, that, uh, that they're not using their convergence, and they may not be using their accommodation uh, in, in uh, accommodation is supposed to be yoked, but mm-hmm. uh, I think when we were looking with one eye and we give the other eye a rest, we don't have to use quite the same amount. Uh, the lag is a little bit different. So it's, it's amazing the, the brain and the eye can adapt to new technology. To brand quickly, new technology right? like the iPhone 4. And yeah, and that's wow. Like, okay. So, so we look for more on that as, as we uh, get closer to publication. So we also want to talk about our disease thing today, and that will be about cataracts. And and Len, you've been keeping up with the latest in nutrition and cataract prevention. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, this 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 topic is a, a little bit kind of controversial in, in a sense in North America because uh, based on different study uh, so far, there's no like uh, conclusive evidence that vitamin C can prevent cataract uh, progression. Uh, but this study actually just came out from India, and then they uh, have 
about like 6,000 uh, subjects from the north side and the south side of India. And what they found there, found the, the conclusion is that uh, vitamin C uh, does have a beneficial effect in terms of reducing um, progression or development of cataract by about 40% com comparing the high uh, level of vitamin C in their plasma uh, versus the people who have low uh, vitamin C um, level in, in, in their blood uh, stream plasma. So, so the data is quite convincing in a sense that uh, vitamin C does have a beneficial effect to prevent uh, cataract development and, and probably the mechanism is, is, is because uh, vitamin C is well known to, to serve as antioxidant to absorb oxidative uh, radical, uh, things like that. And also another fact is vitamin C in terms of concentration in the lens is like 20 or 30 percent higher compared to uh, the plasma concentration. So if you have enough vitamin C, it does play a protective role for the lens against uh, oxidative stress. So this finding is more relevant to a uh, country that are poor, poor developed country, uh, similar to probably India. And, and this is a major uh, finding because in India, cataract actually account for a very high uh, percentage in terms of causing blindness and, and eye disease or eye-related uh, type of uh, disease causing blindness is account for about 20% of the disease in, in the world, actually, the India population. So, so this um, can be uh, helpful for a lot of, of people in, in poor developed country in terms of just getting enough vitamin C level in, in their uh, diet. So another resource that you share with me, because James, you, you're teaching the course on nutritional. Yeah, we just uh, completed yeah. it, and it's also yeah. available if you log in through the Pacific University website to iTunes University as a guest. You can, you can find our podcasts of that course, Non-Nutritional Optometry. And uh, yeah, we teach that every summer. But we, we use a major resource just down the valley from us. We have the, at, in Corvallis, Oregon, um, we have the uh, Oregon State University, and, and the Nobel Prize winner, Linus Pauling, left his... Uh, body of research to them. He won it twice, right? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. And, and he was well known for his taking mega doses uh, in the grams uh, per day level of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's left his institute. The Linus Pauling Institute is at Oregon State now, and they can be found online um, at uh, LPI, I think, dot org and state dot edu. And they, uh, they have a micronutrient research center, and I mentioned they have a disease index as well as a micronutrient index. And you can look up the latest evidence on cataract prevention and vitamin C, and I believe there's information there on riboflavin and thiamine as well. Uh, so yeah, some very, very good information coming out. It's always getting updated by Oregon State. And, and I, I particularly like, you know, how many of us, even though we have all the vitamin C all over this country, how many of us know what our plasma level of vitamin C is? You know, mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. we keep diet diary if we're, if we're told to, but, but boy, we don't know how much we really have in our bloodstream. Sure. And yeah. it's uh, unlike some other mammals like rats, I think it's some... some Nocturnal goats. We, mm -hmm. we can't store vitamin C. Not, uh, not so too yeah, well. that's if why it's a vitamin. It, you just, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so like this the, this Peruvian woman we show here uh, uh, opposite the Indian study. Uh, you know it's uh, we're we're at risk due to elevation due to ultraviolet and other oxidative factors in our environment. So what's on next week, Len? Next week we're going to talk about actually vitreous flora, which we see a lot in our patient, and and most of the time we say just just live, deal with it, adapt to it. But there's some some interesting uh, recommendation right now. Maybe you can do something about it. And one way to do something about it is your flora pellet. I can see on the well, picture well, right now. Well, don't blame me for it, but I do have a sample of them on my desk. So I, you're going to try we, it. We, we, I think we should try it during, oh, we the, should. during okay. the podcast yeah. next week. We'll see what happens. We'll to do. Our floaters. I will. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and uh, and we're also going to talk about the the new 3D movie industry. Yeah, and that's the next tra trend, I guess. You have smartphone and then you do 3D movie. So we'll say, uh, do a 3D like movie to cause eye strain or visual discomfort. And, and you may have some interesting things to share. I, and then we do have a 3D clinic coming up, right? That, that's Beaverton. right, opening in Beaverton. And, we, and there's a new term if you do a Google search on this called binocular dysphoria. And it was mm. so controversial that people in the binocular vision department here felt like we shouldn't tell the students about it because it may not exist. Mm -hmm. But we'll tell you about it here on the Islet Wit podcast next yes. week. So. I'm Dr. James Kundar. I'm Len Hua. And until then, we'll, we'll see you online. Okay, so that's a good sign.